Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. This is episode 57. Yes, little by little, we are working our way to episode 60, which, as I mentioned, is my um, my next milestone. Anyway, uh, busy day today. Very busy. Actually, uh, most of my day was spent preparing for this weekend. This is what happens when we start getting towards the end of the week and we have a show coming up. Listen, I've, I've said this before. I love traveling. I love what I do. I feel extremely blessed to do what I love and get paid for it and get paid pretty pretty decent, you know, to a point where I can live pretty comfortably. I can do what I want. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'm a very creative person. Every day I'm working on something exciting to me. It might not be exciting to anyone else. But to me, it's exciting, whether I'm working on a store, whether I'm working on a video, whether I'm working on like a podcast like this or um, working on one of my sales packages or my radio station or something um, that, you know, writing my books, you know, can't forget that (laughs) writing scripts, you know, sometimes not even things that, that make me immediate money. It's like I just need money to survive, to be honest to make me happy, money to survive. So that way I can do what I want to do so that I can be creative. I'm not one of those dudes that sit in front of the TV all day long or that's not my day. I'm not one of those dudes who I get up in the morning. You guys probably know know people like that. You get up in the morning and they think, "Ah, so what am I going to do today? That does not exist in my world. I can't even imagine it. You know, my thing is when I wake up, it's like, okay, how am I going to get everything that I want to do uh, done today? <laughs> you know, or well, how much of it am I going to get done today? You know, so I, I constantly and for years, I live off of to-do list. I mean, if you look at one of my file cabinets, I have probably a hundred notebooks. Okay. And if you pulled up any of those, co- those, um, composition notebooks and whenever I you know whenever I see them I always grab a few because I go through them and if you look at the cover of each one of them they are all they all pertain to an idea something that I'm interested in something that I'm working on sometimes it's not even something I'm still working on but this is what happens I can start a project Okay, I'll create an entire notebook and I use that to take notes and everything I do goes into that. I don't rip pages out. I write stuff. It's stuff that I don't like. I'll just put an X to it um, or I'll just put a line under it. I'll go and try, you know, do something else underneath it and I'll just fill up this, this notebook. And this is everything from creating story ideas to creating, you know, um, my 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 e-blast to it's everything uh book ideas and and um sometimes i'll start something i'll be extremely excited excited and i'll kill it like i'll i'll, I'll go hard on it until i basically dry myself out okay where the ideas just kind of like they come to a stop but that's fine okay i take it i put it back in the drawer and i forget about it all right. So almost any project I have that I've worked on in the past, whatever, as long as as long as I remember, probably let's say living in North Carolina, which is, I don't know, 12, 13 years. So living in North Carolina, uh, any projects I've done, uh, colognes, like I said, merchandise, um, wristbands, uh, ideas of my page freestyle against phonies or any of these things. You can kind of, 
you know, kind of flip through them in the cabinet and pull out a book and you'll find one of those uh, projects. So like, let's say all of a sudden I have some ideas for La Radio. Okay, I got a bunch of ideas. I'll go through that and I'll, I don't have, I can't read them from the top. It's just the way it's set up. I have to actually lift them a little bit so I can read the, the covers. And as soon as I find the La Radio one, I pick it up. I have these little clips. They hold the page open. And that will stay on my desk for whatever, a few days. And all I'm doing now is throughout the day is I'm taking notes about it. I always date my pages. Well, 99% of the time, if you see a page that is not dated, I probably forgot to date it. So, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, so, you know, and then when I'm done and I'm dried up again, I'll close the book. Because sometimes you'll look at my desk and you'll see three or four books. And they probably have been on my desk for about maybe a couple of weeks. So then I get to a point, I start straightening out and I'll look at those books. I'll say, okay, am I working on any of this stuff now? And of course, no, there's going to be something that was, that's been sitting there. So I'll close it and put it back in the file cabinet, you know? So I do that uh, pretty often. So I, I, I always have something that I'm working on, you know? Uh, so it, it's hard for me, you know, so, so where I was going at with this was um, traveling. I get excited, like I get up in the morning because I'm excited to do like my first to um, task every morning for at least three or four hours because I get really early is my book. So um, yes, yes, show has to be out by March 27th. So every morning I know I have to put X amount of time. Like right now I'm about three quarters of the way through the first book. Remember it's three books and now I have basically a month left. So I have to, I have to organize it right. So I know that I have to have this first book pretty much done. I maybe have a few more days left. That's it. So maybe a few days, a few days into the into the new month, into March, uh, I'll be on the road, and I don't like to take my laptop. It's just too much. And the time I actually bought a laptop so I could take it on the road and work on like my book when I'm on the road. But you know what happens? I take the I take the laptop with me, and I don't work on it. Actually, a lot of times when I go on the road, I'm filming. I'm reading, um, or I'm trying to take it easy. That's the only time I try to take it easy. I might meet up with uh, with a few people, you know, talk business, or just maybe hang out, but it's usually at the hotel. I don't go anywhere, I don't go to clubs or anything. So, like now I have a handful of things I'm working on. And I'm trying to beat the clock, like, like let's say like the book. So, I really don't have the downtime, because even on the weekends, like I work on this book until the thing is done, um, then when I start my new book, I'm going to make sure I only work on one. I'm not, I don't want to do this three book series again. It was a lot of work. Um, and it's very easy to get confused and get lost. So it's constant. And then again, notes. So I have a book out there called, yes, yes, y'all notebook. And it's all full of notes. And it's about, you know, in the notes, I have stuff like, uh, Let's say I have an address or I have somebody's age or I notice that someone likes someone's car is red. I make sure I note it because those are little details that I will forget and I'm not going to sift through the book looking for that information. So I just go through my I go through the notebook and I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Car was red because just recently I wrote blue. So I fixed that, you know. Um, so, yeah. So so now since I, I know I have a few days more that I have to you put in to finish book one but now I gotta stop and I have to go on the road now tomorrow I'll be able to get you know uh, get my morning in and uh, do some writing but uh, Friday I'm not gonna be able to Friday I gotta be on the road Saturday and Sunday uh, and then Monday I can get back to work so I can, I can hit it again on Monday but you know and anybody would say oh man I'll be more excited to you know hit the road then yeah I'm excited but, you know, I ha I'm on this moment. I have this thing going, you know, like I'm riding this bike and I got a nice steady pace and I hate to have to get off the bike right now. You know, I feel like I'm getting somewhere. But uh, so that, that's that's the only thing. So that's why I spent this time now is um, is just um, preparing for the weekend, going to get haircuts, getting our nails done. Uh, well, not my nails, you know, angels, and um, and then, and then that's it. Uh, the only concern that I have right now, watching the news, is this damn 
coronavirus and uh it's scary man it really is it's scary my daughter's in germany and she works in a hospital so of course i'm definitely afraid for her so i'm just hoping that uh the doctors and the nurses there take extra precaution i'm sure they will you know they're professionals so i can't see uh anyone in there you know getting affected like that you know that should be the last place um however i will be in an airport a crowded airport i will be in an airplane with recirculated air you know um we bring the wipes down with us we pretty much wipe everything down the table the little table in front the the air vents the the handles the, the what you call the armrest and um my concern though the biggest concern i have is getting stuck in texas please 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 if they're going to shut down airports let them do that now because i cannot get stuck in texas that will really really mess me up to the point where i might have to rent a car and drive home and i've never driven <laughs> that that far i don't even know if i can do it so um not something I'm hoping will happen. Uh, it's actually really, really, it's a really scary thought. I don't want to get stuck. The last time I got stuck anywhere was with, um, was in uh, Chicago. Well, one time I got stuck in the airplane for like eight hours, man. That was horrible. Uh, little Susie and them, I, I spoke about that story. Um, another time I got stuck in a snowstorm in Chicago. We ended up having spent an extra three days in the hotel. I was uh, I was not happy at all. Um, it was just a, a bad experience. I just, you know, you want to be stuck, you want to be stuck home. You don't want to be stuck on the road, you know? Not to mention, mention you just made some money and now you basically got to spend that money to survive for the next three days. <laughs> so that really sucks. So please uh, say a prayer that I make it to and from with no issues and uh, get back and get my hustle on. Um, I have a few weeks off um, so far. Now, I could get a call tomorrow and that could end. We can, I can have something that's, it could be a rush. I've done those, uh, those rush shows before. So, <clears throat> um, you know, but, you know, that's the only thing, you know, the whole thing with this, this, with this, um, with this business is the traveling. Now, when I lived in New York, it was a different story because, well, with little Susie, we did a lot of, uh, we, we flew a lot. We used to do a lot of New York too. And with Angel, I used to do a lot of New York. So a lot of times it was a little more picking us up um, and then taking us to the venue or the club and then bringing us back the same night, you know, which was always sweet. That was always a sweet deal. I said, really, I, I do miss those. Um, but then I got to a point where we started traveling a lot. We were like the only ones really, really like on an airplane every single week. And, um, and that became like everybody wanted that. I used to get artists contact me all the time. Hey, man, I see last week you was in Chicago. Last, the week before you was in, you know, San Francisco. This week you're in Texas. Next week you're in Florida. I want to hit the road because... What I was missing is stuff that a lot of these other artists are really dreading. They 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 go they hit the road, but not as often. Like if we get called for a show, a hundred percent of the time we're gonna fly. Me and Angel, we're not gonna drive. A hundred percent of the time, unless they call us from Myrtle Beach. They did that one time, and we drove there, but that doesn't happen. So, hundred percent of the time we're gonna get on a plane. Now if we lived in New York. And we're gonna get a plane because there's no shows here in North Carolina. Um, the market is still kind of being tested. So, and it's growing, I think it's growing, but it's not ready yet, it's not ready. Um, but when we lived in New York, like you could do a show every weekend in New York. So you have a car pick you up and take you to a venue, do your show, get back home. The only thing is New York, New York I don't even know now, but I remember the shows, um, clubs used to stay open pretty late. So they all had that what, 4 a.m. Uh, license or whatever you call it. A lot of the, the clubs now, they close by 2 a.m. And um, that was rough because a lot of times they wanted us on like 1.30, 2 a.m. Oh, my God. They used to kill us with that. Because they used to pick us up like 11 o'clock 
we used to get to the venue like midnight, you know, and then we were going on at one or two o'clock in the morning. Oh man. <laughs> I mean back then it was fun. It was it was actually cool. And it was cool, you know, you go to these clubs and you kinda see a few people that you recognize from the from the neighborhood and that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. I I, I I miss that. I miss that. But it's not the same. It's not the same the way it used to be, you know. Uh, to me, the New York market got kind of dark. I mean, there was a lot of, yeah, a lot of shit going on there. You know, you know, it was just, it was just weird. It was just weird. You know, a lot of people were just, they're just following the wrong leaders. I gotta be honest, man. They're just following the wrong, the wrong leaders, and it just creates this really dark atmosphere, and it kind of sucks for our genre. However, I get on a plane like this week. I'll be in Houston. You know what? It's gonna be wonderful. We have Stevie B. Uh, Lisa Lisa, Jocelyn Enriquez, Cover Girls, I love them all, I think they're all mad cool, they're all cool with me, and it's always airy and light, everybody's kind of like bouncing around, happy, so we're cool, and then we'll do Austin, it's just the Cover Girls, I think they might have one person opening, like a local act opening, but that too, I know I know that venue, that venue's gonna be fine, it's gonna, we're gonna have a good time, we'll do the show, it's gonna be, it's gonna be really cool, you know, um, they just called me tonight for an artist, um, one of my favorite, I won't, I, won't, I won't bring her up anyway, but she's one of my favorite, um, and uh, I can't talk about it because uh, the show is still up in the air, but they called me, and uh, I was more than happy to, 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 I haven't booked her in a minute, and uh, so I reached out to her, but what these guys did is they wind up shopping the deal, see, they, I give them the numbers that I know she's going to want. And what they do is, you know, to them, they think that they can shop around. Like, like if this is a, a, a flea market, you can just walk around and you're going to go and you're going to go with whoever gets you, you know, the cheapest deal. But what they don't realize this is that when you do that, OK, we are not the ones that make the price. The artists do. So think about it. OK, so if the artist is asking for X amount of money and they see all of these people coming to them, or at the very least, two, two different agents coming to them for the same exact show. What is that artist going to say? Do you really think that that artist is going to say, okay, well, I'll take the one that brings me the least amount of money? Absolutely not. And you can't, you can't hate on them for that. That's business. I would do the same thing. If I have two or three, you know, agents coming to me for a cover girl show, I'm going to give them my numbers. I'm going to say, yo, this is my bottom, but let's see, can any of you bring it up? You know, that's just the way that is, you know, but, you know, and because they're dealing with their own clients. They're not dealing with my clients. My clients different, you know, I don't want to, you know, I want it to be fair. I don't want to sell an act to one of my clients only to, for a particular price. And then they find out from somebody else that they could have gotten that artist cheaper. Because what happens there is they look at me and in their mind, I up the price and I don't do that. You know, I don't need to, I'm an agent. The artists pay me from whatever needs to be paid. So if the artist gets X amount of money, I don't need to add 10% on top of that, and make it, you know, XX amount and sell that to the promoter. I never have to do that. Whatever the fee, the price is that the artist wants, they will give me my commission from there because I have been, I am a legitimate agent. I have been doing this. This is what I'm known for doing. So I'm not just a dude that knows someone at a club and says, yo, yo, I know this act. I can get you this act. Those are the acts that the artist will tell them, okay, cool, I need this amount of money. If you want to charge more, you could, so you got to add on top. And what happens there, it, start, it, it costs those promoters more money. And when the promoters call, like if they call me, and I say, okay, let me get in touch with the artist, you got to give it a minute because the artist has to get back to me. Then what they do is they get on the phone, they, they can't wait. And they call an agent. Now you got two agents calling the same artist. The artist is going to say, well, okay, cool. Give me this number. <laughs> Give me this money. And I can't blame them. That's the way you do business. Shoot. But, you know, it's not the artist's fault. It's the promoter's fault, you know. So all the promoters out there, man, you guys, you know, figure out what you want to do before you make the phone call. Don't start. Don't create your own price wall. I've seen that bite people in the ass so many times. And every other artist has seen it also. You know, you know what happens to I've had people 
check this out, that have contacted me, let's say for the cover girls or for little Susie, one of my exclusives, one of the acts that you have to come through me for, right? I'll give them a price for, let's say, little Susie. They say, oh, that sounds like a lot of money. Okay. All right, let me call you back. So they'll say, let me call you back. And you know what they do? They call other agents for my artists. Now, all of a sudden, I'll start getting calls from other agents. And they'll be like, yo, La, um, I just got a call. Somebody's asking and inquiring about little Susie for this club on this date. Same, it's the same date. It's the same people. And I told them, and I tell them, I say, yeah, I know who that is. And they say, oh, they called you? I said, yeah. I said, but that's cool. I just need this. You can add your money on top. So now what happened is, now the price is going to go up on that promoter. Because I don't want to diss that agent. That agent's calling me now. I like to get calls from other agents. That helps me with my work. And I tell that agent, I'm like, okay, you know what? Since they didn't like my number and they went to you, then you know what? This is the number. And what, what do you think happens? Of course, the promoters call me back. And there's only been a couple instances that I reneged and, and okayed the show and said, okay. And it's usually because I really didn't want to work with that agent anyway. It's an asshole. So um, there's a few of those out there. They know who they are. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, so uh, so you know, so I would just take the show anyway. Uh, but they would learn their lesson at that point because they thought at that moment, and some of those agents would add up to a thousand dollars on top, you know. So why, you know, why do that? So you have to really, really do your homework before you start making calls. Um, if you use someone who's not an agent, they're gonna have to add on top. No, no, no artist is gonna pay them a fee. They're gonna have to add on top. Um, if you call an agent. Uh, same thing. Agent has to add. Another agent has to add on top of mine. Just like if I call another agent for an artist that they represent, they're gonna say, "Okay, this is what I need, but I gotta get my money." They say, "So whatever you add on top." And what's cool about it is that a lot of times they let you add whatever you want. You know, um, the numbers always have to be right. You know, so I, I usually don't charge more than ten percent. But if you think about it now, you the promoters basically paying that extra 10%. I'm not going to say he's paying extra for what the other agent was charging because the agent, that agent most likely is going to get paid within the price of the of the artist, from the artist. But my 10% will have to be added on top because I'm going to another agent to buy it, you know? So, and I've done that many of times. I've done big artists. I've done Salt and Pepper. So, I think about an act like Salt and Pepper that I booked for um, the 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 manager at that time used to book salt and pepper for 50,000 okay so what they did is they came to me and they say and I, they said la um 50 grand i said okay but i have two shows back to back for them what can we do and they'll come back and they'll say okay give me 45 give me um 45 grand each show that's 90,000 that means i can still charge the 100 the 50,000 each which is what they normally go for, and I can keep that ten grand. So it's it's kind of cool. Um, so that's usually how they they'll work it out. You know, they'll work it like that. I do that kind of deal also with like agents that I'm cool with. There's a handful. There's a couple that are serious assholes, man. Like they just they're greedy and they just they don't play straight. They don't they don't play fair, um, and they're always running into crap. But then there's a couple that I actually like working with. So I kind of give them full full uh full reign as far as what they want to do um i've done the same thing with um mc hammer you know you're talking about acts at 80 grand 100 grand 50 grand 60 grand a lot of hip-hop acts you know i don't do i've done more hip-hop acts than i've done um pop acts i don't do pop acts but freestyles are you know of course a lot a lot cheaper than that um but those some of those big hip-hop acts uh especially the old school ones there pretty significant. They have a good relationship with their managers, so I'm able to, to to call them and get the fee either lower or get it for what they would normally charge, and I still can I can eat from that fee. I don't have to add on top, so it's, it's a good thing, and that's from being a legitimate and uh, agent for, you know, almost 30 years um, and having a really good relationships and making sure that all these shows go smoothly because that's why once, once you have a show and there's bumps, 
A lot of times you can get resistance from the Zars. A lot of times when I've had bumps, it wasn't my fault. It was promoters trying to get over. So it created a really bad environment for that artist. And of course, I'm part of that circle. Kind of comes back on me. So now what happens is when I call that same artist for a show, right away their guard is up. Well, you know, we're going to have to do it like this, man. Because that last show, and it's almost like they look at me like I was a promoter. Yo, I wasn't the promoter, man. <laughs> but the only time that really happens that they have a problem, if it's the first show. You see, if I put an artist on eight shows over the next two years, and everyone was great, not a problem. A lot of times the artists and the, and the managers come back to me and they praise me and they love you. I love doing your shows. Everything is smooth, never a problem. But then I have that one hiccup that somebody screws up. They usually don't hold that against me. We're usually cool. But if it's the first show, the first show that happened to me with Taylor Dane, my first show, the promoter screwed up and that came back at me. And it was because these these managers were not used to working with me. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so uh, I kind of screwed it up. We patched it up since then. But, man, that sucks because that's they feel that you as an agent aren't making good decisions. But the thing is, the promoter I booked, them, I booked her with is a really good promoter. I've done, God, I got to say I've done about 15 shows over t the last 10 years with this promoter. Never an issue. It just happened to be that this particular event that this promoter was doing, he pulled in a partner, an outside partner, and the partner was not familiar with how things were done, and shit didn't get done right. And it just got, ah, oh, everything was messed up. The bad thing is that I wasn't even on the road, so I couldn't even, like, help out. I couldn't fix. I couldn't, you know, I was in California doing another show, <laughs> you know? And this one, I think, was in Chicago? Yeah. So, anyway... All right, guys, listen, um, thank you for listening. Please don't forget to, to like, share, subscribe. If you have any questions, please comment. Uh, any questions about the business, put it in the comments, man. Whether it's on Facebook, um, go on to Facebook. You can look for um, Good Night Freestyle Podcast or Good Night Freestyle. That's the Facebook page. The YouTube, it's under Latif Mercado. Just go down. You'll see that playlist with Good Night Freestyle. Um, Feel free to ask whatever questions. A few of you guys are asking questions, but you're sending them through Messenger. I guess you don't want people to know that you're asking questions or you don't. You try, I don't know what the problem is, but um, some of those questions you're asking are pretty general. And they could probably help somebody else. So if you can ask me the questions in the comments and just kind of be patient. Let me, uh, if it's like a rush, like you, you're doing something tonight or tomorrow you need to know then you can put it, send it to me as a message so I can get it immediately. If not, put it in the comments. Give me a little time. I'll get to it. I'll try to answer as best as I possibly can. Um, and hopefully other people will see it. Maybe they have the same question as you and it, it can help them. So, all right, guys. Thank you so much. Until tomorrow, good night, Freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.